All right, Shabbat Shalom, Israel, and Yahawada, Judah. This is Malak Ba'am Mashah coming at you again. And uh, this is the third week of the 11th uh, Hebrew month, third Shabbat, should I say. And uh, thought I'd come at you, as I normally do, with some more teaching. We talk about the Father. Our major teaching is about the Father, and then we teach about the Son, and we teach about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Because Jehovah Shai told his disciples, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, te excuse me, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. All right, teaching them to observe in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So we're still on this teaching, mainly about the Father. You know, I think it's, it's righteous when we uh, put the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the rightful places. Because normally what I hear is a lot of teaching about Yahweh Shai doing everything. All right. About like Yahweh Shai doing everything. But what is the Father doing? Oh, he's just leading Yahweh Shai around in an invisible spirit. You know, there's something wrong with that. And when Yahweh Shai said that, uh, that he sent from the Father to do what he was doing. But uh we're gonna we're gonna go into this. We're gonna we're gonna explain is the you know is the father gonna come down? Will we see the father? All right. Will we see the father? And if we see him, what's gonna be what what is this gonna be like? All right. As we see in the Book of Daniel. Let's go there real quick. Book of Daniel, we see the Ancient of Days coming down, right? Ancient of Days coming down. Does he come down before the sun? Mm -hmm. Excuse me there for a moment. Uh, the ancient of days, as he come down before the sun, we see that the angel said, we see that the angel said that Yahweh is coming back the same way we saw him leave. He ascended or he got taken into heaven on the Mount of Olives. Two angels stood there and, and said, men of, men of Jerusalem or men of uh, Galilee, why are you stand there looking in the sky? The same Jesus, Yahweh Shah, which is taken up from you, shall be, shall return in like manner, as you saw him going to heaven. But is that what we're waiting on? Is we, are we waiting on Jesus or Yahweh Shah to come back down from the sky? All right. I don't think so. We're gonna see him come back, that's true. But will he be the first thing that happens from heaven? No, the scripture says that. We see in Daniel chapter seven, we see uh, four beasts that will reign over the earth from the time of uh, Babylon, probably 600 years uh, BC. Four beasts, Babylon, Media Persia, uh, Greece, and then Rome. And we're still in the Rome phase of that fourth beast. All right. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 8 speaks about those four beasts in order. So Babylon reigned from 600 BC, somewhere around there, till about uh, four or 500 BC. Then we see Media Persia. 
from four or 500 BC to about 300 BC. Then we see Greece, Alexander the Great, 300 BC, somewhere around there till uh, 100 BC. Then we see Rome rise up. All right. And Rome rises up and a little horn comes out of Rome, right? A little horn. Let me say a word of prayer real quick. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this Bible study. We ask and pray that you're blessed and blessed there to be edification, exhortation, and comfort in the reading of your word and the studying of your word, hearing of your word, as well as the ministering of your word. By Shami, I will share my share, we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, we see the Rome, Roman kingdom, the fourth beast is where we're still at. We're still in that phase right now. All right, and that fourth beast, uh, let's see, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, that, and after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Rome was symbolized by the, by the, by the metal iron. So each of these beasts seem to have something to do with some type of metal. Uh, with Babylon starting off with gold, you know, real precious metal. Media Persia with silver. All right. And we have Greece, with like bronze is a bronze metal. And we have Rome that's symbolized by uh, iron. It has great iron teeth. And it devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. All right. So it had 10, basically those 10 horns are like 10 kings or 10, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 other nations or, or realms that rang and wooded. I considered the horns and behold, I came up among them on, uh, another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by, plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men and the mouth speaking great things. Is it, is it, did you turn on that heat? Okay. It's starting to feel a little warm in here. All right. So let me read that again. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men and the mouth speaking great things. So this, these, these uh, prophecies go all the way to the end of days. You can go to Daniel chapter 2 and see this in a statue. All right. You can see in Daniel chapter 2, you see the whole thing in a statue. Like a great image. All right. But this this little horn, you know, is it is it the the what is it called? Roman Catholic Church. It could be a few things. But I kind of liken it unto the Vatican. And it had eyes like the eyes of men and a mouth speaking great things. You see the Catholic Church speaking great things, all right? Against you, how? All right? So this is where it ends off at with, this, with these beasts, the little horn. All right? The little horn. And uh, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to show you what that, that the ancient of days comes before Yahweh Shai. All right. So Daniel was grieved in his spirit in the midst of his body and the vision of, of his head troubled him. He came up to one of those that stood by and asked him the truth of all these things, of all this. So one of them told him, made him know the interpretation there. All right. That these great beasts are four kings which arise out of the earth. All right. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Right? So that's where we at talking about the fourth beast. Because why? Why? Because the fourth beast is the last one, which means the end of these of these kings rising out of the earth, which will have to have something to do with the kingdom being restored to Israel. All right. Remember, Daniel was a descendant of King David, so he would definitely be interested. All right, because he's of the royal seed, royal seed line. And I will know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful. 
whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, was devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. All right. It's really so nice because it said the teeth was of iron and nails of brass. That brass color goes along with Greece, too. We see the Greco-Roman Empire. They was kind of more like one another. As a matter of fact, the Greco, Alexander the Great was the beginning of Western culture around the world in the world. But that, what that means when I was in school, what I saw it as is that it's the beginning of the white Western European people ruling the world. All right, that's the reason why they're so crazy about Alexander the Great. I mean, we see movies about him, he was a homosexual and, and all of that, all right? That's probably the beginning of all of that too, because we know that the, the Eastern kingdoms which featured Israel and Afro-Asiatic kingdoms were not too crazy about uh, these things that this culture is crazy about. LGBTQ, you know, you know, all of that. They were not too crazy about it. All right. Nails of brass, which is the Greco-Roman Empire. Iron is Rome. Iron is Rome. The nails of brass is Greece. Another 10 horns that were in his head and up the other, which come came up, and before whom three of the first, three of the first fell. Three fell, excuse me. You know that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So we see that what's running out of Rome still to this day is the Catholic Church. All right? The Catholic Church, basically, up until recently, in recent times, you know, was running the world, was ruling. And it was a religion that was that was killing folks. They was persecuting people. Okay, anybody that didn't agree with their doctrine, they go out and send their Christian Christian soldiers out there and kill them. Okay, they had a king over them, which was called the Pope, the Papal King. Okay, and as a matter of fact, in the fourteen at the end of the fourteen hundreds, the fifteenth century. All right, it was the Catholic Church that. That sanctioned slavery. That basically made put made put slavery on the on the market. That caused the the black people from Spain and Portugal and Africa to go into slavery to be sold as slaves because they would not convert to Catholicism or Christianity. They was uh, Hebrews. So if you study that real well, not just let somebody tell you anything. What they want to what they want to tell you. You studied it real well. It's still it's in history books. It's called the Inquisition. They basically started per persecuting and torturing these black Hebrews for not wanting to convert to Roman Catholicism. And eventually the Pope okayed the Inquisition. And then at the end of the Inquisition, they basically took them off and sold them for money to other nations. The slave ships. Especially with the New World starting a new world with America, the Americas, the Caribbean. All right. So we see that going on. The slave trade was really a slave war. It was really a war, to be honest with you. And it was a religious war because the Pope did not want another people in the earth to not bow down to him. And if there was a people that would not bow down to the Pope, it was the Hebrews. And the Hebrews in Spain and Portugal were there since the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the time of Babylon. All right. It was there in Spain and Portugal from the time of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. But that was a war. They call it the slave trade, but it was really a war. And the, the losers got sold off into slavery, in which those were the children of Israel. Daniel 7, 17 says, these great deeds, which are four, are four kings, shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth. Daniel says he would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse with the nails of, with the teeth of iron and the nails of brass. 
All right, that's what we were just talking about. That's what we were just at, verse 20. Not the ten horns which were in his head, not the other which came up. And for whom three fell, or even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth, and spake very great things. His look was more stout than his fellows. All right. I beheld in the same horn and made war with the saints. There it is. So where well, you can find it in the Bible where the, the slave trade was really a war is right here, Daniel 7, 21. So there was a little horn that came out of the, the fourth beast, which is Rome. This little horn was really a religious king. He made war. It says he's the same horn made war. Can you highlight that? Hold on just a moment. I like this word war. So it was not just slave trade. I think you just found some Canaanites in Africa and made them slaves because of what the scripture said. It was a war. All right. And uh, they did try to say that that the people that were sold off in the slaves were slavery was Canaanites. All right. But uh, I don't think so. I think Canaanites are part of this world system. They're part of the world. All right. And if you, you know, I wish I told his disciples, if you was of the world, the world would love you. But because I've chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. All right. The Israelites are chosen out of the world. So the world hates them. So the Canaanites are part of the system that hates Israel, that, that's on their side. And I guess if you want to believe your church is correct and righteous, that all you're doing is basically righteous stuff but enslaving some Canaanites or some people you're saying was Canaanites. Make get, the, get people that type of brainwashing going on. But these people were Israelites and they didn't come from, They it's a lie to say that they all came from Africa. What was they doing in Spain and Portugal? Huh? If they weren't, uh, if they were Canaanites. And what were they doing with a religion called uh, Judaism? All right. What were they doing with the Judaism religion? Canaanites didn't believe in all of that. They were, they were pagan worshippers, Baal worshippers, and all of that. But what was these people that they say it was Canaanites worshiping the, the God of the Bible with a religion that worships that has the Hebrew language and everything worshiping the God of the Bible? If they were if they were Canaanites, it don't make sense. All right, by the hell the same horn made war with the saints. Who are the saints? The same horn is running the world. <clears throat> This war, this king that's running this world, he's a little horn, made war with the saints. A lot of people saying, no, I don't believe that this is going to happen in the future. No, it already happened. It's already happened. Those are the people that want to stay in denial. It's already happened. They've already made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So where is this happening? All right. I believe in the truth. The truth is what makes you free. And you study these things and find it to be connected up to the people that's over here in the Americas, people of color that was basically in, that was chattel, chattel slaves before they were free from it, and that are still being oppressed. They're still in captivity. This matches up with them. He made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until, let me highlight this word, until. So that means until something happens. Let's see what that, let's see what happens. That changes things. Until Jesus come down from heaven on the Mount of Olives? No, until there's a highlighted word right there. So he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days. And everybody knows who this is right here. This is the father. Until the ancient of days came. 
till the ancient of days came. All right. And judgment was given when the ancient of days came, judgment was given to the saints of the most high and, and, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. This ought to make Daniel really happy right here when, when he heard this. All right. So you notice they don't say anything about Yahweh Shai coming right there. All right. It's the ancient of days that coming. All right. So after the fourth beast, the ancient of days comes, he puts an end to the fourth beast. So basically that war is going to continue on until the ancient of days comes. And the ancient of days is the one going to put an end to the war. He's going to basically overcome this little horn, this king. He's going to defeat him and destroy him. I beheld the same horn, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He's prevailing until, guess what? The ancient of days came. All right. So he couldn't whip the ancient of days. Who was the ancient of days? The creator. So basically what's coming before even Yahweh Shai was coming first into the world to change things is the ancient of days, the father. And it says he came. He didn't just be with no ooh, ooh, spirit that's in the atmosphere. And you can just feel his presence and then you get the get power and you overcome. No. I'm gonna show you something real quick. This explains it from another point again. All right, this little horn had eyes like a man. Like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. Okay, that's verse 8, chapter 7, verse 8. Chapter 7, verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. In the ancient of days did sit. We're going to highlight something real quick here. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. All right, cast down. Let me highlight this. So what happened? Thrones were cast down. All right, that means the throne, the king, the little horn, and all his constituents, his, all his buddies, were cast down. Let's look at that word, 74, 12 in the Hebrew, or word cast down. Let's see what it says. To throw, set, set figuratively, SS. I don't know what that is. Asses or asses. Cast down, imposed. So, so what happened was the ancient of days came and threw down. He threw it down. He threw that kingdom down. How did he do it? You should know. If the father comes, what's he gonna do? He's gonna knock everything down and make everything that make everybody know who he is. So the ancient of days. Did sit. All right. So what does that mean? The ancient of days did sit. Let's look at the word did sit. 3488. To sit or dwell. That's why I say that the father's coming to dwell with us. He's going to be seen. All right. To sit or dwell. To set. Sit. To be set. All right, and then guess what? How you know he's gonna be seen? Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. This right here lets you know that he's coming and he's gonna be seen. He's not called the son of man or anything. Well, I think he is called the son of man, but he's not called Yahweh Shah. He's not the son of God, all right? He is God himself. The one that everybody wants to see. You don't want to see God himself. You, you basically are an enemy of God. The hair of his head like the pure wool. Now what people on the face of the earth have hair like pure wool? Let me, let me highlight this again. What people on earth have hair like pure wool? This right here will tell you a lot about this ancient of days of God the Father. All right. He's going to have to be manifest in the flesh. All right. In order for him to be to not come down here and burn up everything, 
like he did on Mount Sinai. He burned them. You check out Mount Sinai in Arabia. You'll see that the top of the mountain is burnt. And scientists and people all over the place have tried to figure out how did that mountain get burned up there like that? Well, read Exodus, you know, read Exodus, especially chapter starting around chapter 19. All right. And you'll see how the mountain got burnt. Okay. Children of Israel got, came out of Egypt and he led them there to that mountain and came down on. But right here we see in this ancient of days, which is God, the Yahweh Allah. He's, he's coming to put an end to the to his people's uh, captivity. All right, they rebelled against him. Now that time was over. Where he's coming to to redeem them. And his hair is like pure wool, which is telling you that he's among a certain people. Whatever people this is that he's with, has hair like pure wool. And we know Afroish type hair is like pure wool. Hair that doesn't grow down to the ground; it grows up to the sky. All right. Hair that's woolly and grows up. All right. Hair like pure wool. We know those of uh, Negroes, what we call Negroes, Negis, Niggers, whatever you want to call them. Those are the type of people that have hair like pure wool. Hold on just a moment. Did you want to answer? Okay. He has hair like pure wool and it's thrown like a fiery flame. His wheels is a, a burning fire. But the key is what I want to focus on is right here. His hair is like pure wool. In order for him to come down here, all right, and dwell with people, dwell with the people, he's going to have to be manifest among those people. In other words, to make a long story short, just like Yahawashai was born into the world, obviously with two parents, not just with a virgin birth, like the Catholic Church taught us. Get it? The Catholic Church taught that doctrine, virgin birth, which is coming out of Babel, Samaritus and Nimrod, coming from paganism, ancient paganism, about a virgin that gave birth to a child without the aid of a man that comes all the way back from Babel. It's pagan. All right? So the Catholic Church gave the whole world in Christianity that doctrine. But Yahweh was born of a father and of a, and of a mother. All right, the scriptures have been intentionally rendered in a way to where you, that that thought that he was born of a virgin could be believed. But when you look at the study, you study the scriptures really good with a fine tooth comb, get your Sherlock Holmes eyeglass or magnifying glass out. He, his father was Joseph. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to be sitting on the throne of David or 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 an heir to the throne of David. You don't become an heir to a throne in Israel among the Hebrews through your mother. You become an heir through your father. And then that's where someone say, okay, his stepfather gave him, because he was, he was the stepson, he gave him the, the right. No, it's through the blood, it's through the genealogy. That's how Yah does it, it's through the blood. All right, through the blood, he, he has a right. If that's his stepfather, he still doesn't have a right. Because the stepfather didn't give him his blood. All right? The blood is how you get redeemed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So God is all about uh, genealogy and, and blood and uh, being re having redemption through shedding the blood. So it's the same way you get your inheritance in the land of Israel through the blood. So Yahweh or Jesus was not heir to the throne because he had a stepfather that was. All right. He was, he was the heir to the throne because his father gave him his blood. He was really a son of Joseph. Now, spiritually, he was the son of God. But physically, he was the son of Joseph. Joseph and Mary. All right. So in the same way, Yahweh Shai, who is the lamb of God, he's the lamb of the ancient of days. In the same way, this lamb was sent before the ancient of days. He was sent before the ancient of days to come into the world. All right? And he shed his blood so that the ancient of days would be able to have redemption. Salvation. And that's in Revelation chapter 7. When you see the great mass of people with white robes on, 
standing before the throne saying salvation to our God that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. What does God need salvation for? Huh? Salvation to our God that sits, sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. What does the Lamb need salvation for? He's the one that through his blood he gave salvation. Revelation chapter 7. So, so Yahweh the Lamb is the Lamb of the Ancient of Days. All right. The ancient of days that he's not he's not boasting of, of being the lamb. The lamb would be somebody that would that would put to shame sin in his flesh. That's his major purpose. That's the major purpose purpose Yahweh Shai did. He put sin to shame through through his flesh. He never sinned. All right. That's what the lamb is all about. The lamb of God, the lamb of the ancient of days. All right, so this ancient of days would come down in flesh. That means he would be born just like Yahweh Shai, born into the world, except he'd be born in captivity. All right, he'd be born in captivity amongst the Israelites in captivity. And he would be born, he, he, he would be born without the knowledge of who he is. <clears throat> you know, let, let me put it this way. He would not be born and everybody be saying, guess what? The ancient of days was born into the world. Here he is over here in this city right here. Like they did Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai had that, that entry into the world. The angels, you know, made it known. But with the ancient of days, when he comes into the world, nobody had known it. And if they had known it, Esau is bigger than what he was back at the time. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Meshig, Yahweh Shai. Esau basically was wanting to find out if this person would be born into the world so he can try to take him out again. Okay? So Esau, which is basically ran by Satan, all right, the devil, the dragon, was looking for this one to come, that's going to come into the world in the latter days. But he's coming into the world in a way very inconspicuous. Okay? So he'd be born into the world. He'd have hair like pure wool. And then Revelation chapter four says his his color would be as it would be jasper and a sardine stone. It would be the color of a jasper jasper and sardine stone. Woolly hair, jasper and sardine stone skin. All right. So we search the scriptures out that this one is coming down. He's not just coming down from heaven to dwell with us like he did in Exodus chapter twenty four, and then he took off on a on a sapphire stone he's not going to do that hold on just a moment but this time he's coming he's going to be he's going to be enthroned in the end so what's going on with this god that's coming he's coming before yahweh and we just saw that the that the little horn waged war against the saints and prevailed against them until this ancient of days came and did sit. His his garment was white as snow, and that's a, that's right there, uh, profound, because we see these this multitude of people in Revelation seven that standing before the throne, saying, "Salvation to our God and to the Lamb, to our God that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb." And then the uh, elder asked uh, John the Revelator, "What are these that are wearing in white robes? What is this all about?" And John says, "Sir, you know, I don't know." He said, these are they that come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. All right? So when we look at this, this right here is another sign of how this ancient of days is going to be in the world. He's going to be in the world as a regular human being. He's going to be a believer in Yahweh Shai. Remember Yahweh Shai said, the Father's in him and he is in the Father? Everybody that believes in Yahweh Shai is in Yahweh Shai, right? Everybody gets born again and believes in Yahweh Shai is in Yahweh Shai. They're in the body of Christ. So this ancient of days will be in the body of Christ. Not only will he be in the body of Christ, but Christ will be in him. He said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So he would be born into the world as a regular human being. He would get born again and be probably filled with the Spirit. All right. Right up under the nose of the dragon. All right, he would have a garment on white as snow. That means he came through great tribulation and washed his robe in the blood, white in the blood of the Lamb. And this is mentioned way before Revelation. But when you look in Daniel chapter 7 in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, 
you see that this that they was already making a way for that understanding that those that would be wearing white robes would have their robes washed white in the blood of the lamb. So his his robe is white as snow. Okay. So the ancient days is a human being that would basically have his have his white robe washed for, through great tribulation. He have his robe washed white as snow. Now that great throng in Revelation 7, they, they didn't say they had robes white as snow. They said they had white robes on. But his robe is white as snow. That should tell you something. Okay. All right. And the hair of his head is pure wool. His throne is a pure flame and his wheels is burning fire. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books was open. And I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the, which the horn spake, the little horn that we're talking about. I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. All right. So what takes place here before Yahweh Shai even gets back? This judgment day for the nations, tribulation. So in other words, the ancient of days is going to destroy the fourth beast. It's going to destroy the little horn. This warfare that's been taking place against Yah's people, his ancient Hebrew people. It's gonna be put to it's gonna put it be put in, into the ground. It's gonna die. Their war, their their victory over the Hebrews, over over descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be over. Who's gonna put an end to it? The ancient of days, and he's gonna be a person that comes out of the earth. He's gonna be born into the world and he's gonna come out of the earth as the ancient of days. We see something like this in what is it, second Ezra chapter 13, and some books, the secret that I got is fourth Ezra. Chapter 13 was this man comes out of the sea and he's flying all over the place and wherever he looked, the the, the earth burns and wilts away because of his gaze, his look. He's flying all over the place and flying in the sky and all of that and the nations of the earth get angry about it and they come to subdue him to wage war against him. We see this right there in the book of 2nd Ezra or 4th Ezra chapter 13. All right. That's not talking about Yahweh because Yahweh when he comes, he's coming from the sky. And this will prove it to you. All right. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. So this is this uh, this is Yahweh right here. So we see the ancient of days comes first and puts an end to the little horn, the, the fourth beast is reigning over the world today. I saw in the night vision that behold, one one like the Son of Man. Right there, that one like the Son of Man, even though that one is in italics. That like isn't in italics. So something like the Son of Man. So who's the Son of Man? The Son of Man, basically, guess who? Is this Ancient of Days. The one like the Ancient of Days came with the clouds of heaven. So who is this coming with the clouds? Jesus. Yahweh said. That's what the angel said in Acts chapter 1. Or Acts chapter 1. When they said, well, men of Galilee, why are you stand up looking in the sky at this? That this that that this one that's named Jesus, Yahweh, he's gonna come back again and in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So he's not coming from out of the sea like that, Ezra says. He's coming from the sky. He's coming from the from the from the from the heavens and in the, in the clouds. And that's what he when the uh, when the chief priests before they crucified him before they handed him over to Pilate, asked him to say, "Are you the are you the Christ, the Son of God?" Eventually, he told him, he said, yes, I am. And hereafter, so you see the Son of Man, what's he going to do? Sit on the right hand of, of the throne of God and come in the clouds of glory. All right? So after thousands of years of sitting on the right hand of God, he would come later. After the Ancient of Days does his judgment, then he would come in the clouds. So that's what we're seeing right here. So let me read that again. I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds. See that? Come with the clouds. He's not being born again into the world or reincarnated. He's coming from heaven with the clouds. Came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. So why is he why are they bringing him to the ancient of days? Because the ancient of days is the father. He's the one that's greater than than Yahweh. And they brought him near before him. What happened then? That was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom 
that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. All right. So who who's the one that judges and puts the the four beasts, the kingdoms, the kings, and throws down their thrones, uh, their thrones to the ground? Who's the one that does that? It's not Yahweh. It's the ancient of days. We're going to go back up to verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The ancient of days cast their thrones down. In ancient of days did sit. And there's a scripture that says, In that day shall will Yahweh Allahim be exalted. That means no nobody would be exalted but him. Yahweh Allahim alone will be exalted in that day. I think that's how the scripture goes. All right. He will, all, he will be the only one exalted. He's going to throw every throne down and he's going to sit on the throne of the earth. Now that he gets done putting an end to these other thrones and kingdoms and judging them, then Yahweh Shai comes back. Then Jesus comes back. So what we've been hearing in these churches that Jesus is the next thing we see is a lie. Why is it a lie? Because it's been taught to us by the Western Christianity, by the Catholic Church. Because they why? Because the Catholic Church knows that what happens, the truth of what happens is with the ancient of days. That Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. That's what happens. They don't want you, they don't want to see the ancient of days come. In other words, they don't want the ancient of days to come, so they, they ignore it. They want to see Jesus come back because Jesus might, if he comes back by himself, Jesus might have mercy on him. No, that's not what happens. Everybody's running around and, you know, all the Protestant churches are saying, well, it's known that the Protestant churches come out of the Catholic church. But who taught, the, who taught this doctrine that Jesus is coming back first? The Catholic church. Because they basically, when they see that, the ancient days did sit, that right there is enough to basically make them burn right there. Hit the lake of fire almost. Oh, I almost fell into the lake of fire. All right. They don't want to know that. They don't want to hear that. They want to keep that quiet. Why? Because maybe they can wage war against him and keep it from happening. See? And it's not in the scripture where the ancient of days will be born. He would be born in captivity because his people would be in captivity. But what happens is he grows up. And a lot of scriptures that's talking about, that you think it's talking about Yahweh is talking about him. And Yahweh Shai, they, they basically... It's like a double-edged sword. One side is Yahweh Shai, the other side is Yahweh. Like, you saw, like Isaiah 53 talks about, Lord, who has believed that report? That Isaiah 53 is talking about both. It's talking about Yahweh Shai and it's talking about the ancient of days. Both of them would be born into the world as human beings. The ancient of days is not coming into the world as God right off the top. He's the one that becomes. You see that in the scriptures. It says he was, he is, and he is to come. He's basically going to be manifested, being born from Israel. He's the basically the man child in Isaiah 66. He's the man child in Revelation chapter 12. That's born from the woman that had the crown of stars, the crown of 12 stars on her head, moon on her feet, clothed with the sun, crying and travailing to give birth. She's he's the man child born from that woman, which is basically Israel. He's born out of Israel. Isaiah 66, the man child. He's the one that's going to call Israel to be born in one day, come to pass in one day. All right. And then, and then David says, that the Yahweh said unto my Adon. In other words, let me, let me read it like it says it in the King James. All right. Yahweh said unto my, okay, let me read it exactly like it says it there. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. When it calls, Yahweh Shai Lord, it doesn't call him Yahweh. And Yahweh Shai confirmed that. And he said, he said, uh, they asked, he asked the, the Pharisees that were constantly, you know, drilling him in the scriptures, not looking forward to finding an error. He asked them, he said, what does the scripture say? Who is the Messiah? They said, the son of David. He said, if he's the son of David, then why does, why did David say, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit on my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? So he put him to silence with that, all right? That the Messiah that would come into the world would be the son of David, physically, the son of David. All right? 
So he's the Adon right there. You see Yahweh. So cow calves your Lord. That's the that's the name that you would you would click on. You would find out that name Yah that all caps Lord is Yahweh, and the uh, capital L little O little R little D is Adon. And that's he's talking about Yahweh Shai. So Yahweh said unto my Adon is what David said. Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So this is Yahweh Shai, or excuse me, this is Yahweh the ancient of days coming down and making Yahweh Shai's enemies his footstool. He's the one that's going to whip their heads, and then when it's, once he puts them down, puts all of these thrones and kingdoms down, then he sends for Yahweh Shai from heaven. Yahweh Shai comes from heaven on the clouds. And I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. That was given him dominion, glory, kingdom, by all people, nations, languages should serve him. The dominion is the everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom that will shall not be destroyed. So the ancient of days is in the position of being like David. David basically kicked the whole world's tail in warfare. And once he basically had Israel reigning over the whole world, when he passed away, he died and he gave the the kingdom to Solomon. And Solomon didn't have to do any war. He was a great king, he was wise. He knew how to, you know, God taught him how to handle the kingdom through wisdom. All right? So basically, what we see is that the ancient of days is like David and Yahweh Shai is like Solomon. All right? So it's the ancient of days that come and defeats the world that wages war with the, with the nations, with the Gentiles. All right? And that's, that's the reason why I say I like to talk about the Father first, then the Son, then the Holy Ghost. Put that in order, you know what I'm saying? Just like he, he did in Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Put it in order. But the, the heathen nations that are Christians don't want to hear this. You want to really make them mad, make, make their blood boil like as if they they on fire? Tell them this, what I just told you. It's not your house that's coming first, it's the ancient of days. Ancient of Days got their number. Ancient of Days is the one that created them to do what they're doing. He's the one that's going to take them out from doing what they're doing. Ancient of Days allowed them to do what they did to, so he could punish his people. His people were disobedient and disobeyed his word, his laws, and his, and his covenant. He allowed them to do what they were doing to a certain time. When he's born into the world and he rises up to become an Ancient of Days again, who he really is, the time is over with. Now there's nothing they could do to keep their kingdom. All right, their thrones are going to be cast out. The ancient of days is going to sit. All right. So that's where we at. We at that right now. So that and do I think the ancient of days is in the world today? Yes. I know he's in the world today. Look what Joel says. <clears throat> when he when he starts kicking tail. He's going to deliver Judah first, the kingdom of Judah, the people that were bought over in the slave trade. Goes to show you that he's going to be one of them. What tribe is he going to be from? It's, you know, straight up, Levi. When Moses prophesied about the end days of these tribes, what it's going to be like, he obviously was talking about the ancient of days being from the tribe of Levi. We'll go there later. So Joel, let's go to Joel real quick. Joel chapter 3. Oh, for behold, in those days, let me highlight this for you real quick. It starts off real tough on you. For behold, in those days and at that time when I should, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. What is it talking about, Judah and Jerusalem? It's talking about the kingdom of Judah. All right, the kingdom of Judah, which consisted of Judah, Judah Levi, and Benjamin. And the, and the city of Jerusalem had all 12 tribes in it. But that's the way they said Jerusalem, all right? He's not saying he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna right off the top deliver the, the house of Israel, which was the kingdom, the 10 northern tribes. He's talking about that, those three, north, three southern tribes, along with the remnant of the, all 12 tribes that's in Jerusalem. In other words, he's going to 
take Judah, the kingdom of Judah, out of the captivity that the little horn placed Judah, the kingdom of Judah, in. All right. When these nations got over here and saw these Native Americans, they knew that they was from the 12 tribe, 12, excuse me, they knew that they was from the 10 most tribes. Even uh, Christopher Columbus, if you look at the movie, what is it, 1492? Look at that movie real good. He tells us, he says, basically, he knows that what's going on, who they are over there, because they because of the book of Ezra, second Ezra. Second Ezra chapter 13 again. In some books is fourth Ezra chapter 13. Which tells that who, who, who they were and where they were at. They were in a place called Astros. Excuse me, Azras. Which is, that's what they called this Turtle Island over here before they became America. All right. But behold, in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and parted my land. So basically, that's what he's coming, ancient of days is coming to do. You think they're going to be able to mess with him? No. No, 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 no. That's just like saying, can the nations defeat God? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. He's put himself in a position to where the nation can say, let's take him on. And they will. They're going to they're gonna take Yahweh on, but they're not going to take him on from glory. They're going to take him on in his in his, in his his weaker position as a, as a human being. All right? Now, let me tell you what's going to happen with him. All right? He's going to basically rise up just like Isaiah 53 says. He's going to grow out of a dry ground. All right? He's going to be despised, rejected of men, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. All right, he's gonna suffer a while, but then the, what God already predestinated him is to come out of it. To all of a sudden become uh, what would be called a superhuman. I call it a superhuman. All right, I think he's gonna be kind of like a Samson right off the top. We see it in Second Edges or Fourth Edges, chapter thirteen: the man coming out of the sea. He's not like really a humongous person, like muscular. You know, he's a small guy. But he's really Yahweh. He's the one that's becoming Yahweh. We see in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, the first seal is open. And then there was a white horse, saw a white horse. And the white horse rider was sitting upon him. He had a bow and a crown was given unto him. A lot of people think that's the Antichrist, but that's really... This man right here that we're talking about, the ancient of days. He's coming, he's basically overcome. All right, he overcome. He, he's gonna overcome his situation. He's gonna, he's gonna basically break out, like, what is it, Micah? Micah chapter, what is it, two? The breaker is broken up and gone out. All right, Micah chapter two, I think that's verse 11. Let me see real quick. Get my other phone over here to look at some scriptures outside of what I got on the computer. Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2, verse 13. The breaker has come up for them and have, they have broken up. Let me read it again. The breaker has come up before them. And that word breaker means like somebody that breaks out. Broken up and come and pass through the gate and they are gone out by it. And he calls them their king. He says, and that king shall pass them before them and Yahweh on the head of them. All right. So the breaker, he's going to be that breaker in Micah chapter 2, verse 13. He's going to go up before them. All right. Where's he going to go up to? He's going to go up to Jerusalem. Gonna go up to the real Jerusalem, the, the physical Jerusalem in Israel, and he's gonna go up to the Mount Zion that's in the heavens. All right. And he's that ain't he's that little, he's that what's that man child in Revelation chapter 13, 12. And he's the man child that's in Isaiah 66. All right. So basically, he scattered his people among the nations, and he's basically telling them why he's judging them. All right. So 
So he's the one that's going to do this. Let me see. Let me see some more scriptures. Hold on just a moment. Joel chapter 3, verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. So we saw the little horn wage war against the saints and prevail against them. So when what happens is when, when in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, when that white horse rider gets crowned, notice that, the, that this white horse rider cannot be uh, cannot be of the nations because they would that crown would have been a diadem. It's just one of their crowns. But since he was wearing a Stephanos, so he was crowned with a Stephanos. So that means that believers reward crown. That's, that's the crown the scripture speaks about that believers in Yahweh should get, Stephanos. All right, so he's crowned with Stephanos in Revelation chapter six, verse two. And he goes forth conquering and the conquer. What does that mean? He goes forth overcoming. That, con that word conquering is the same word for Nikeo, Nike, Nikeo. He goes forth Nikeo into Nikeo. I mean, that's the same word for in the book of Revelation chapter two, verse chapter three. And it says to him that, to him that overcomes, all right, that's that word for he that overcomes and every letter to each church that it was written to, he that overcomes is he that nekeo, same word. So this white horse rider overcomes, all right? He doesn't basically just, just, just come out and just oppress people. He overcomes what was thrown at him. He's gonna come into the world and overcome all that the devil had for him. All right, he's gonna go for conquering and the conquer that means overcoming and no overcome. And he's the one that's written about in Revelation chapter two and chapter three, the one that overcomes in his church. To him that in the chaos, he that overcomes, will I give this when I do this? His church is talking about him overcoming. His church age, put it that way, his church letter. All right. So he says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles in the latter days. Didn't say it in the latter days, but this is what it's talking about. This is what it's going to happen in. Prepare war. So they had his people in captivity, but he's coming and he's going to say, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Be your plowshares and the swords and your pruning hooks and the spears. Let the weak say, I am strong and assemble yourselves and come. Ye, all ye heathen, all, that means all the nations. All ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. Did the cause I mighty ones to come down, O Yahweh? All right. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit. Then we just read that. And Daniel said that the, the ancient of days came and he sat. And he had a garment on white as snow and his hair like the pure wool. Well, right here it says, for there will I sit. So this is the ancient of days. A lot of people think that this is just some symbology. They haven't read the scriptures correctly yet. It's not symbolism. This is him going to literally do this. But there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. The, little, the ancient days came and he did sit in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Put ye in a sickle for the times, for the harvest is right. And we see this in Revelation chapter 14 about a man with a crown on his head sitting on a cloud with a, with a sickle or something, you know. Revelation 14, I think it is, or 15. Put ye in a sickle for the harvest is right. Come, get, get ye down, for the press is full, the fast overflow, for the for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. And we see this happening in 2nd Ezra, so 4th Ezra, chapter 13, where the nations of the earth basically gonna, they're going to have a war. They're going to be fighting with one another. And when they see this man that has this mysterious power, they're going to leave the war that they have one toward another and come to Subdue so the man that came out of the sea. This is the man that came that comes out of the sea. It's not Yahweh Shai. This is him right here. What does it mean coming out of the sea? That means he came out of the sea of people, the nations. The sea of people. In Revelation, it said that the woman sat on the sea. She's on a she's on a beast, but the, the she was there was a sea of people. So this little horn, I mean, excuse me, this ancient of days is coming out of a sea. Probably a sea of people that basically worship Catholicism. They have the Catholicism religion. Because the, the Babylon, the, the great, the great whore, 
basically see there's a sea of people basically that has to do something with the Catholic Church. People that the Catholic Church reigns over and has to has power over, whether they're in Africa or, or in Europe. But this man comes out of the sea, and you know, he comes out of this same sea that a lot of these nations are in that's bound down to the Catholic, the Catholic Church. Comes out of a sea of people. And it does say that in Revelation chapter, what is it, 17 or 18? When it explains the sea, it said these are multitudes. Let's go there real quick. Let me see here. So I don't just be quoting scripture. You don't know what I'm talking about. I got a habit of doing it, you know, especially since I got this condition with my stroke from last year. Okay, let's see. Let's see, it tells you the sea of people, Revelation chapter, let's go to chapter 17. Okay, it says waters, Revelation 17, 15. <clears throat> and he said unto me, the waters which I saw is where the whore sitteth. Our people, let me highlight this, our peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the Catholic Church has a lot of people under them. All right. So the Pope has a lot of people that's worshiping him and, and uh, sees him as God, uh, the vicar of Christ or whatever. And the people, and he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Let's see what this word waters means, 5204 in the Greek. Let's see if it says something about seas, a sea or something like that. Okay, it is not exalted, exhausted. Water, is it rainy, literally or figuratively, water? All right. So she sits on the sea of people, waters, which are people. So does this man comes out of the sea in Second Ezra, or Fourth Ezra, chapter thirteen, comes out of waters, which is symbolic of peoples, like it says right here. So people, multitudes, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. We go back to what we just said. But the jaw. So let's see here. Hold on. Jaw region. So what we got going on is that. Yeah, how is like a lion sneaking up on the system? Okay. He's telling them, come on, let's fight. Gather yourselves together, prepare war. Beat your plowshares and the pruning and the swords or something. Let me see, let me go down here. Beat your plowshares and the swords, the pruning hook and, and the spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. And simmer yourselves, all you heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Did there cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yahweh? Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit. Remember, the ancient days will sit in Daniel chapter 7 to judge all the heathen round about. Put you in a sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, that, come get you down, for the press is full, the fast overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahweh is near, in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall withdraw their shining. Yahweh also shall roar out of Zion. All right. Now, what happens is, is that he gets crowned. When he gets crowned, 
And Jehovah I mentioned that time, he said that if those days had not been cut short, no flesh would be saved upon the earth. Because they, you know, all these, these nations got these nuclear bombs. So who's going to cut the days short? Yahweh's going to cut it short. The one is coming. He's going to start the war. What we just saw, prepare war. Verse 9 of Joel, Joel chapter 3. He's going to start the war. All right. And when he starts the war, he's going to control the war. That means they ain't going to be able to do nothing against him. They ain't going to be able to press a button or anything. All right. Yahweh should roar out of Zion out of his voice from Jerusalem. That means when he when he gets crowned, he's kicking the tail. He's going to chase them into the dens and rocks of the mountain. And that's the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6. He's going to chase all of the rulers, the rich, the rich men and the mighty men and the great men. And they're going to say, hide us from the face of the one that sits on the throne. They're going to be running to the mountain, fall on us and hide us from the one that sits on the throne. Who's the one that sits on the throne? The ancient of days. He's going to be in there. Otherwise, why are they saying hide us from the face of the one that sits on the throne? From the wrath of the lamb. And it didn't say the lamb was going to be here, but from the wrath of the lamb. Because the one that sits on the throne is going to exercise the wrath of the lamb. All right. And one that sits on the throne is not Yahweh Shai, it's, it's the ancient of days, it's the father. All right. Yahweh also should roar out of Zion. That means he's going to do a, a sacrifice in the temple. He's going to cause the temple to, to, to be erected to supernaturally, probably, right there where that dome of the rock is at. It's going to be holy. Except when he, when he causes it to be erected, he's going to have a throne in the, in the Holy of Holies instead of the Ark of the Covenant. All right? And I spoke about that last week and a few weeks ago about there not being an Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in that temple. Because he basically, Yahweh said when he died on the cross, he was a lamb of God. He tore, the, he tore the veil in two. That means that the, the, the way to God went now was open. That means Yahweh can come down here without killing a bunch of folks. All right? Without burning up people. He can come down here and have mercy. But as far as the nations are concerned, the most people are going to see his wrath. All right? Because they're going to deserve it. They're going to basically fight against Yahweh. <laughs> all right? He's, he's not he's not a person that that just wants to come and kill some folks. He's not like that. He's a God of mercy and truth. But what's going to happen is the nations are going to fight it, going to fight against him, going to be taking it to him. He's going to tell them, come on up. He, he didn't make them fight. The fact is, fact is, he said, come on up, let's fight, prepare a war. And they did. They come to subdue him according to 2 Ezra chapter 13, 4 Ezra chapter 13. They come to subdue the man that came out of the sea, out of the waters. All right. To roar out of Zion, that means once he does a sacrifice in the temple, see, let, me, let me explain this. He's going to do a sacrifice, and that's Ezekiel chapter 45. The, this prince is going to be called the prince in Ezekiel. He's going to basically, before he becomes the ancient of days, before he becomes Yahweh and gets caught up into heaven, he's going to do a sacrifice. All right. That's the reason why I can, you know, the scripture speaks of him being a Levite. All right. We're going to do a sacrifice in the temple. We're going to sacrifice in the holy days, especially. All right. And you see that in the book of Ezekiel that this prince in Ezekiel 45 and on is sacrificing, doing sacrifice, sacrificing creatures. And every time he sacrifices, Israel among the nations are still among the nations going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed. And then that's when the nation's going to say, hey, you know, in the places where it was said to, to everybody, you're not God's people. There should it be called the sons of the living God, Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, I think it is. That these people are going to see that these folks are blessed. And what's going to happen is they, the blessings is going to come on these people. And the cursing that was on these people that was that are now blessed, the curse is going to go on to the heathen. They're going to take the blessings off of Take the blessings off of the heathen and place it on his people. I'm gonna take the curses off of his people, place it on the heathen. All right, hope I said that right. You're gonna take the, the the blessings that are on the heathen off of the heathen and put it on his people. I'm gonna take the curses that was on his people off of his people and put it on the heathen. All right. That's what's gonna happen. He's gonna do that sacrifice so much to where it's gonna catch him up to heaven. 
That's what we see in Revelation chapter 12. We're talking about the son, the man child. It says the man child was caught up unto God into his throne. So he's going to get caught up through those sacrifices. He's going to stay up in the heaven for 40 and two months in Revelation chapter 13. When he goes up into heaven, there's going to be a war. Michael is going to fight against the dragon, and the dragon's going to fight with his angels. They're going to get kicked out of heaven. But what happens when, Mike, when the devil gets kicked out of heaven, the dragon? He comes out and possesses the man that's basically meant to be possessed, the son of man, the son of perdition, the man of sin. He's going to possess him. That son, that man of sin, that son of perdition, is going to go into that temple that was erected, that has a throne, and sit on that throne and say, he's the God. He's God. All right? And the nations are going to be deceived by it, too, because he's going to allow him to have power to deceive the people that's deceivable. He's going to deceive the, 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 the deceivable. The Bible says that the latter days of Drake, all right, it says wicked men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But the people that's going to be deceived are the, are the ones that are deceivers, all right, when they see that happen. They're going to believe that this one that just that's sitting in the temple now, in the place of the one that, that did sit in the temple at first, they're going to say that he's the one that's God. All right. Now, what I don't, I don't, I wonder about whether that man child is going to sit in the temple before he's called up to God. He might not. And the temple might just have a throne in there waiting on Yahweh to come down. But what happens is he gets caught up into God into his throne. And read that correctly in Revelation 12. He, he gets caught up to being God and sitting on God's throne. See? Because a short work will Yahweh do up on the earth. What work is that? That That's the work right there. It's a short work he's going to do up on the earth. So he's going to go up there for, for 42 months. After Satan is kicked out, he's going to be up there for 42 months. And then that's going to be a time of great tribulation. All right? The, the saints, the saints that basically got themselves ready during that time when that man child was offering those sacrifices, the, the, the ancient, what is the man of sin, the son of addition, won't be able to do anything with them. But the ones that were playing around are going to be destroyed by them. They're going to be deceived by them. And some of them are going to be killed by them. But those that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, the scripture says in the book of Daniel. All right? So they're going to survive the 42 months, the ones that were really living for Yahweh. They're going to, be, they're going to survive it. All right? They're going to be strong and do exploits. He's going to be up in heaven for 42 months, and after the 42 months, he's going to come down. When he comes down, he's going to resurrect the saints. Gonna resurrect a lot of people that sleep in the dust of the earth gonna rise, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contempt. All right. When he comes down, he's gonna resurrect the saints. And then he's gonna come down. That's when the Antichrist, the man of sin, or whoever he is, the son of perdition, is gonna be toast. He and that he and that false prophet, which will probably be the Pope, gonna be toast. They're gonna get wicked for those 42 months. They're gonna really do some real wicked stuff. But we see that in second Ezra, so fourth Ezra chapter 13, that the man that came out of the sea basically flew up into a great they formed a, a mountain in the in the in the air, in the sky, and flew up upon it. All right, he flew up upon it. So that's when he's up there for three, what is it, 42 months. When he comes back, he's gonna basically roast the Antichrist and the men, uh, the false prophet. He's gonna roast them with fire. So basically, the man that's in Revelation chapter 19, many people think is Yahweh is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is really the Ancient of Days. Because Yahweh comes down after the Ancient of Days, puts all of those enemies up under his feet. So he basically toasts them. He roasted them. You know, it says he, the book of Daniel says, I beheld till, till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the what? The burning flame. All right. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, 9 and 10, I think it is. He beheld till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. 
All right. But uh, but he's coming back. He's he's gonna go up to heaven and sit on the throne for three and what three and a half years, forty two months. He's gonna come back, and that's it. That's it. But before he goes up into heaven, he's gonna offer sacrifice in the temple. While he's offering sacrifice in the temple, the whole world gonna know about it. Because the 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 chief men, the mighty men, and every bond bond men, free men, those people that were running the world is gonna be hiding in dens and rocks of the mountains. Afraid to come out because they you know, they saying hide us from the one at the face of the one that sits on the throne from the wrath of the land for the great day of his wrath is coming, he should be able to stay. So just putting that in order. All right, this puts it in order how this thing is gonna happen. So there's going to be a certain amount of time for this man that is going to become the Ancient of Days. It's going to be victorious over all the enemies in the world. We don't see this much in doctrine. We don't see people teaching this doctrine. All right? We don't see them teaching that doctrine. But when you go to that uh, song, let's go to song real quick. Or the Psalms 21. The king shall join thy strength, O Yahweh. Who, who is this? Who is this? You talking about? Oh, Yahweh said, No, you got to you gotta read it better than that. The king shall join thy strength, O Yahweh, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. So, this is talking about that one that's coming, that's going to become the ancient of days. He's going to become that one that sits, it's the ancient of days. One that sits on the throne who's really Yahweh. Now remember, Yahweh can be in heaven and on earth at the same time. All right. Now Yahweh Shai, can he be in heaven and on earth at the same time? No. He's a he's a regular man like all the rest of us. All right. But Yahweh can be in heaven and on earth at the same time. He can be a human being and he can be a spirit, a quickening spirit at the same time. But let me read the rest of this. Thou has given him his heart's desire, has not withholding the request of his lips. See lot. But thou prevented him with the blessings of goodness. Thou set a crown of pure gold on his head. Is this Seth, is this the Stephanos in Revelation chapter 6 that's going to be placed on his head? All right, because it says, I beheld a white horse, and he that sat upon him uh, had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, right? Let's see, is this the crown that's set on his head? The Stephanos of pure gold. Let me highlight this real quick. So this is talking about not Yahweh Shai, it's talking about the ancient of days, the God that sits on the throne. When he comes down here as a human being, he asks life of thee and thou givest to him long, meant the days, even forever and ever. Let me highlight that. So this person right here is not going to die. He's going to ask life. He's going he's gonna to be destined to die from the system. Satan, the dragon that runs the world, is going to try to take him out. He's going to destine him to die. Like all human beings, because Satan has the power of death. All right? He's going to destine this man to die, but he, it won't happen because what does it say? And he answered, he was answered by Yahweh. And he gave him length of days, even forever and ever. That means the man didn't die. He had length of days, even forever. So he's going to live on forever and ever. His glory is great in thy salvation. That word right there for salvation is Yahweh. Let me show it to you. His glory is great in thy salvation. So his glory is great in Yahweh. I mean, Yahweh said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. All right, this is what this means. All right. So, you know, they a lot of people got the name Yahweh messed up. They say Yeshua, uh, Yahshua, and all of that. All right, but his name is really Yahweh Shai. Well, how, how, how do you do that when you, when you study and find Yahweh Shai in this? You take out these uh, vowel points, these, uh, these uh, where I'm pointing at right here. Take out these dots, these symbols right here. Before, before Israel had these dots and symbols, which come from the heathens, this name. When you look at these words, these letters right up here, is that the regular letters? It spells out Yahweh Shai. All right, it spells out Yahweh Shai. One day I'll show that to you. 
what each one of these sounds like without those points and vowel points and all of that comes out to Yahweh Shai. All right, but with those points and all that, those letters comes out to Yeshua. Okay. Well, let's go back where we was at. His glory is great in thy Yeshua, in thy Yahweh So he is in Yahweh ancient of days, when he's in his flesh. All right. His glory is great in thy Yahweh honor and majesty as thou put upon him, as thou laid upon him. For thou, for thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy kindness. All right. So he's going to be the most blessed forever. Let me go down there and highlight that for you. You know, the disciples were constantly asking themselves when Yahweh was with them, maybe walking places, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to be the greatest? One time Yahweh got a hold to him and he said, I'm going to show you who's the greatest. He took a little child, all right, and set him in the midst. Took a little child, let me show it to you real quick. Matthew 18. And at the same time came the disciples unto Yahweh Shai, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yahweh Shai had called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. He said unto them, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble themselves as this little child. Now, here's what I heard people saying this, that it's the little child that's the greatest. Well, then if the little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what happens when the little child grows up? He's no longer the greatest. It, it's stupid, all right? But he's talking about whosoever will humble himself. Let me highlight that. Whosoever shall humble himself as a little child. Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to answer this before, before we go on further. The same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, all right? So who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The guess who? It's Yahweh, the, the king. So is Yahweh Shai the king or, or is Yahweh the king of the, of the kingdom? Yahweh Shai is a prince because his father is the king. So basically, he's telling you what his father is going to do when he comes to earth. He's going to humble himself as this little child. If though he's Yahweh that sits on the throne in heaven, he's going to humble himself as a little child. Humble himself to who? To Yahweh Shai's salvation. And whoso shall receive one such a little child in my name, guess what? Yahweh Shai said, receive of me. And then they it. I like that. So if you see this little child, you receive in Yahweh Shai. Right, hold on just a moment. But whosoever shall receive one such a little child in my name receiveth me. But whosoever watch this. Now here's the biggie. Here's the biggie. This is what this is what's gonna take place to the to the nations. All right. But whoso shall shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me. It were better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and that he would drown in the depths of the sea. So that's what happens to the nation. That's the reason why he, he fights the nations and drowns them. He, he destroys the nation because they offended him. How did this happen? Does it say that in the Bible? Yes, it does. Revelation 18. Does it say that it, would, it would be better for him if a millstone, right here the word millstone, were hung around his neck and he would drown in the depths of the sea? Okay, watch this. Revelation 18, because remember, the, the greatest in the kingdom is the Father, is the ancient of days. So he humbles himself like a little child. But Yahweh I said, whosoever shall cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's what the word offend means. Let me do that before we go to Revelation 18. All right, this word right here is scandalizo. You know, if you know regular human language, you know, they're coming from that word scandalize. Greek 46, 24, scandalizo, coming from to scandalize, see that? Let me highlight that for you. 
except this scandalized me more than just than the, than the, the what they made it in the in the English language. It means from the from Greek forty six twenty five means to trap to entrap. So what did they do to the father when he come down here as a human being? They entrapped him. That is to trip up. Oh, let's highlight that too. So what did they do to him when he came into the earth? They tripped him up. What does that mean? We don't see that in a second. Go over there. I'm just highlighting as much as I can. Figuratively to stumble. They're gonna make him guess what? Stumble. Isn't that something? Huh? How are they gonna make him stumble? How are they gonna make the father stumble when he comes into the world? Transistorly or to entice the asset right there. To entice to sin. That's why the father, the Yahweh said, is called the Lamb of Yesu. It's called the Lamb of God. He's not the, he's not the Lamb of Israel. He's not the Lamb of the people. He's the Lamb of God. God would come into the world basically and be enticed to sin. He'd be tripped up. Not that God is a sinner or loves sin, is evil or wicked, but they're gonna trip him up, they entice him to sin to do what is what the, in their laws what is wrong. They don't judge him by their laws. All right. Get him in apostasy because he's gonna come down as a human being. He's not coming down as God. He's coming down as a regular human being, basically. Or a displeasure. They're going to use apostasy or displeasure. Make to offend. They're going to make him offend. See that? That's what that scandalizo word means. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me. See that? That's greatest with this one that's the greatest in the kingdom. They're going to offend him. That means they're going to scandalize him. They're going to, scandal, they're going to make him trip up. They're going to entice him to sin. So why? So that they could destroy him. All right. Remember, Satan is like a prosecuting attorney in heaven. All right. Let's go to Revelation 18. So remember, he said, who so should cause one of the little ones to sin, to, to, to offend, it would be better for him if a millstone hung around his neck and he would drown in the depths of the sea. So Babylon is being judged here in Revelation 18. All right, watch this. Revelation 18, 21, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, that's what violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. It shall be found no more at all. All right, so what happened there? Babylon is gonna be guilty against Yahweh. This is what she did to, to Yahweh when he came down. In human flesh, as a regular person, this is what she did. Kind of like when they, uh, when Yahweh sent those two angels in the, in, the, in the Sodom, and they wanted to rape the two angels. That showed Yahweh enough right there to let them know that they needed to be judged. All right? So Babylon, this mystery Babylon in the latter days, nobody, you can, it, the scriptures these it as a mystery. It's going to offend this man, which is really Yahweh. Make him to sin, make him to, to, they're going to try to destroy him, scandalize him. And what did Yahweh I said? Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it would be better for a millstone hung around his neck and he would drown in the depths of the sea. So we see Babylon right here <clears throat> being thrown into the sea like a millstone. <clears throat> and she should be found no more at all. All right. <clears throat> So even though Yahweh stops the war, the world war, <clears throat> stops the nuclear weapons from flying all over the place, the 99 law balloons, he's not gonna do, he's not gonna stop Babylon from being destroyed. What do you think this Babylon might be? What do you think what 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 do you what what is the mystery of this of this country? Babylon in the latter days. What country, what nation do you think it, it really is? Could it be America? Babylon, when it would reign in ancient times, was the greatest nation on earth. Is America the greatest nation on earth still? It's a thought, ain't it? The only nation that's going to be destroyed in the latter day is, is Babylon. And it looks like it's America. And what, is, what did America do? They basically offended Yahweh. All right. 
in uh, Jeremiah says that the, the Babylon, even ancient Babylon, but it's really speaking toward the, the last day Babylon that she sinned against Yahweh. Let me see if I can find that for you real quick. Hold on just a moment. She sinned against the Lord. How did she sin against the Lord? Right in person. Let me see here. Against. Okay, hold on. But it's right there. You know, I've read it before. Well, Yah basically accused Babylon of sin against him. But how did Babylon sin against him? Literally. She sinned against him literally. Personally. Let's see if this is it right here. There it is. Okay, we're going to find Jeremiah. Let's go down. What's really amazing is that Yahweh would literally bring himself down here to be treated like that. Okay, there it is. Jeremiah chapter 50. Let me go there real quick. Let me see the whole portion of scripture. Right, well, the mystery of God in Revelation chapter 10 is what we're talking about. This whole thing is called the mystery of God. God has a mystery. The mystery of God is that he's coming down as he manifests in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preachers to the Gentiles, received up in the glory. That's the mystery of God. So he's going to be manifest in the flesh. Most people think, oh, that's Yahweh, that's Jesus. No, it ain't. Okay, Jeremiah 50, verse 14, put yourselves in array against Babylon, round about, all you that bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against Yahweh. When you read that, you say, how does she do it? Well, she sinned against his people. No. Personally, she sinned against him. Let me see. Hold on just a moment. That means he came down. When he came down, she sinned against him personally. If these, you know, if the nations knew that they were sinning against him, they would not do it. But he caught them off the track, caught them off guard. They didn't know that that was him. But she sinned against your house. Put yourselves in the red against Babylon round about. All you that bend the bow, shoot at her. Spare no arrows, for she has sinned against your house. So we see that man, that man riding the right horse in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. All right, he has a bow in his hand, right? Let me read that again. Put yourselves in a, in a red against Babylon round about. All you that bend the bow, shoot at her. Spare no arrows, for she has sinned against your house. Shoot against her roundabout. She has given her hand 
Our foundations are fallen. Our walls are going thrown down. For it, for it is the vengeance of Yahweh. Take vengeance upon her, as she has done due unto her. All right. So this is the reason why we talk about Yahweh most of all, and we talk about Yahweh Shai next. All right. Yahweh is God. He's the one that that's the God and Father of Yahweh Shai, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. He's coming. He's the one that's going to be here that they're going to offend against. And he's going to take out the nations. And he's going to basically not destroy all nations like he's going to do with Babylon. He's going to destroy Babylon. But she sinned against him. Literally, she contrived to, to do away with Yahweh. Now, you know you can't kill Yahweh, the creator. You can kill the son of Yahweh, which they did 2,000 years ago. He allowed it. But Yahweh lives forever. But she's going to try to take him out. Basically, he put himself in that position so he could take her out. Anybody that evil that has that type of mind needs to needs not to be here. All right, in his world that he created for the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, hitting all them that dwell in it. Yahweh's not no little pussy for the lamb either. All right, he's like a king. He, basically, you you tremble when you stand in his presence. You don't fall down flat on your face. All right. But anyway, Yahweh will be blessed. And as we can see, that all of these scriptures match up with uh, the truth. And I don't know about y'all, I want the truth. I don't want a lie or dogma that somebody else came up with that's not true. And believe in that until the truth happens. I want to be on the truth before it happens. There's a reward for those that basically study to show themselves approved unto God. All right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that you have not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You will not be put to shame in the end if you rightly divide this. All right? Not everybody is given to teach and learn, uh, teach them to learn these things and to teach it. But if you hear it and you search it out, what this person is saying, you find it to be true. That's a reward. That's a blessing for you. Even though you didn't, you didn't, you didn't do the searching. You heard somebody that did and, and found that it's true. That's a reward for you. And Yahweh comes, he basically was well know that basically you're not guilty of all of that stuff. Because two thirds of his own people are gonna be guilty when he comes. He's gonna destroy two thirds of his own people. Only one third gonna, gonna remain and make it. All right. So I pray that you were blessed and that this is another week where you inspired in Yahweh. That Yahweh blesses you with the knowledge and the information you're getting. I'm telling you, this is the truth. All right? So it's not Yahweh Shai that's coming. He's coming second, but the first one that's coming, there's not no rapture, no church. People getting caught up in some clouds. Where are they going? He didn't make people to go up there to heaven and live up there. All right. There's no rapture, no church. It's Yahweh Shai. Yeah, excuse me, Yahweh is coming. He's gonna judge. He's gonna be king. And he's not gonna be plain. All right. I hope you heard me. Shalom.